Well, first of all, <coughs> let me speak broadly. I'm not <coughs> an insider in the Kenyan state system, so mm -hmm. I do not know the mechanics of the discussions that have taken place that uh, led Ruto to change his mind. But uh, what it shows, I, am, I do not agree with my granddaughters, both Fiona and uh, <laughs> Lydia here, that Ruto did the right thing. In fact, this shows Ruto's leadership is uh, weak, confused, and incompetent. Let me begin with the end, then I'll go to the beginning. And I will give each one of you to become president, which job I have uh, <laughs> ever held in the 1920s. The thing you should never do, if people go on the streets and force you to retreat, it is something in leadership you should never do. These people now have gone, burnt down parliament, burnt Uganda house, destroyed the property, looted and did, done all this. If you use mob violence and achieve your result and the president concedes, you are simply giving a signal that the hooliganism and thugger of that type pays. So, if you are a leader, you can always accept reform or to do things on your own terms, not because somebody has forced you. You should never have give concessions when under pressure. That's when you hold your ground. Even if you realize you are wrong, it's better to hold your ground, you can change your mind later. <laughs> so to this degree, I think that the, from a strategic point of view, I think that Ruto has exposed himself in a very weak position. Next time they will overrun him, unless he goes and recalibrates his strategy. You sound like you're calling for anarchy. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, in fact, I'm not calling for anarchy. He should have held his ground, uh, At contained, the, the, contained the protests, and re-establish the, uh, the supremacy of the state. I'm sorry, I'm and and uh, Fiona eh? asks a very valid question. Mm. At, at what at cost? At what cost? How many people, people had to people die had before he could 130 give One thirty had died. Uh, yes, Some but, were being abducted. But to, but What's he, the cost? I, I think that to withdraw, uh, he may have achieved a short-term humanitarian objective at the price of creating, uh, uh, um, of disabling the very mechanisms that will ensure that Kenya is a stable country. In other words, yes, he may have saved 10 lives now, in the next five years or three years, he will cause the death of 50, or maybe 500, maybe 5,000. Why? Because <coughs> young people or any group of people cannot go burn down parliament, do all the kind of hooliganism and violence, mob violence they did, and then you concede to it. He's saying that that is a proper method of uh, protesting against something you disagree with. So now I want, to, uh, you see I started from the front. I want to go from the beginning, why I think Ruto is incompetent. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, <coughs> clearly, one, let me assume he's a competent leader. This Kenya has a democracy. They have popularly elected members of parliament. Members of parliament are very close to their constituents. They went, I'm sure consulted, and he said the, the bill went through consultation process. They developed taxes. Kenya right now, as they tell you, is a bankrupt state. <coughs> in March of this year, they were supposed to default on their loans. Are you aware? For them to avoid default, they had to go back into the IMF program, so IMF gave money. Then, because of the recent uh, hobnobbing with the Americans, the World Bank also gave them about 1.2 billion. Then they put up a euro bond, they raised 1.5 billion. The Kenya shilling had depreciated from 126 to the dollar to 170 to the dollar. So the stabilization came as a result of these moves they made to raise <coughs> new debt to pay old debt. Borrowing from Paul to pay Peter. Right? So the country <coughs> is bankrupt and if it is to resolve its current financial stress, just like Uganda, by the way, is on the highway to Kenya, highway to Ghana, highway to Zambia, these are all these African countries are facing this problem. Next year, Uganda is likely to, will have a bill to pay of 1.2 billion we will have to draw that money from our foreign exchange reserves. They will fall from the current uh, import curve of three months to maybe about to two months or one and a half months. So Uganda is also in a similar situation. <coughs> so here is the challenge. When that sounds so Ugandan. Uh, yes. So, like so, but this is what I'm saying. So if, Kenyan shoes. Uh, well, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> if you, I would imagine the representatives of the people of Kenya that are elected pass a law. Hooligans organize themselves on the street and say we can't accept it. So who should have a say? Because remember that that was not a referendum. The people participating in these protests may be less than 1% of the people who voted. So are they saying that protest can override the decision of parliament? Because I really need to understand. If members of parliament have passed something and they're representing the people, then you are saying that there is no vote, uh, you are removing the vote of no, the mob on the street 
is declaring a vote of no confidence in the parliament. I don't understand that. So it's possible that uh, this mob does not represent the majority of the people of Kenya. And the majority of the people of Kenya elected that parliament. I come to the third issue. I realize that people don't, uh, you guys are not looking at these things. You're looking at the humanitarian consequences in the short term, not in the long term. So the, the country of Kenya needs to raise taxes. We all know people anywhere <coughs> in the world don't want to pay taxes. In this country, no one pay, wants to pay taxes. In Kenya, no one wants to pay taxes. But the same Kenyans are demanding healthcare services. They're demanding education services. They're demanding roads. They're demanding electricity. They're demanding every single thing from the state. How the state, afraid to tax them in order to raise money to pay for the very services they want, goes and borrows. Once it has borrowed, the country is heavily indebted. The same situation is happening in Uganda today. The government of Uganda has borrowed right, left, and center. It has borrowed everywhere. And right now, we are entering a, a, a situation of a debt crisis. <coughs> but every day, we want good roads. We want electricity. We want water. We want health services. We want education services. We want bridges. We want practical everything every day. How is it going to be paid? I think that uh, many people here in Africa believe that they should be there to get services they should have rights without responsibilities. They should get services without any contribution. Okay. Tax. So, do you see, so in, in that sense, the question should be, who should be supreme? A mob demonstrating on the street and burning parliament or the elected representatives of the people? Whose voice should we hear? Thank who you. Should, should mobs on the street have a right to burn down parliament and therefore force a democratically elected government, a democratically elected parliament to withdraw what they're supposed to do? If you disagree with what the government is doing, prepare the next election to vote it out. But you cannot say that you will intervene at any one time, that the decisions of Kenya will be decided by bombs on the street, not by the institutions, the democratically established institutions of the state of Kenya. Thank you very much, Andrew. Honorable Seguna, when you look at uh, what the ladies have said and Andrew, and you look at these Kenyan protests, what do they say to you? <laughs> Well, my grandson is always confused. But, um, we shall settle that debate it later, is, uh, <laughs> grandfather and grandson. It's my responsibility now to, to, to rein in on him. Well, I must confess, first of all, the difficulty with which I discuss this uh, subject, because I'm conflicted in a sense that I'm a very ardent believer in demonstrations as a form of expression. I do not believe in violence. Mm. To me, the moment it crossed into violence, that's where my support stopped. But I vehemently believe that um, demonstrations as a form of expression are legitimate and uh, it's it, it, in compelling situations, they may help resolve some of the issues. The demonstration you saw in Kenya, first of all, of course I expressed deepest condolences to the families of those that lost their lives. Uh, we have lost property. As Uganda, I visited the same Uganda house, I think, two months ago uh, in supervision. We have spent heavily on it. I don't know why of all foreigners' property <laughs> they targeted ours, but I think there has been some uh, circulating rumor that one, we are the advisors to the Kenyan government on how to rig elections. Other people have been saying we, are, we, we sent Uganda police. I think there was something circulating on social media that there was a vehicle uh, belonging to the Uganda police which went to Kenya and so on and so forth. And that's how destructive uh, social media may be. You, Kenya has a constitution with a clause that requires public participation whenever they are making a law or taking fundamental decisions. <laughs> Through that public participation, Kenyans, at least the sample that appeared in the consultations, rejected the finance bill. Do not forget that Kenyans have just been slapped with another tax called the housing levy. In addition to NSSF, in addition to pay as you earn, in addition to VAT and so on and so forth. So the resentment that was demonstrated or exhibited against the finance bill 2024 it is not a standalone. It is hinged onto the past. But equally, do not think that it, is, it can be divorced or separated from the, the, the anger that came from the election results. Whether they were right or wrong, that deep-seated anger has been going on and continuing. The 
open disagreement by, by the deputy president saying I would not support the finance bill can equally not be divorced from the entire uh, conundrum that we're witnessing. To an extent, I would agree with Andrew Mwenda that, uh, you know, when people demonstrate and especially go violent, I don't want to call them hooligans, because sometimes we, we the leaders, push them into, uh, to cross the red line. Uh, and, and you change. It becomes a habit. There is a likelihood that it will be a habit that when we go violent, <coughs> destroy property, there will be this kind of response. I was looking at Kenyans with admiration, thinking, if it was this one's grandson, I don't know how many people would be <laughs> dead now. Because for him, when it comes to power and money, he can kill and eat you alive. So that was my concern when it crossed into violence. I saw at some point when the youth were holding the mess saying, power is back to the people. Uh, like Lydia said, without the mess, there is no legislative authority. So the people captured their power, took it, uh, I mean, away from the legislators they voted and uh, went away with it. Now, before you praise President Ruto, you've got to ask a question how did we get there? What Kenyans were demanding were, was an answer. How did you even think about it that you can have such proposals in a bill? Remember, at the end of the day, we are going to bear the, 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 the brunt of paying these taxes that you are introducing. Why did, did you think about it? Two, through public participation, when we told you, don't think about it, why did you think about it? So. I think all those questions, but I think it also demonstrates to some extent the maturity of the Kenyan police that people were able to break the barriers and get to the level of getting to the entrance to parliament in a demonstration without the, the crude intervention that we normally meet here of both Why the police. Uh, yes, yes. So the they break the barriers, burn down parliament, and you call that... No, 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 no. The point is that the police can look at you and they seek to dialogue with you. They do not shoot you up to the point of getting to the entrance to parliament and break the gate. Or maybe the point Segona, could be that the, the police in Kenya is as dissatisfied as the demonstrators and therefore shared their yeah, frustrations that therefore mm. it is not maturity, it is identification no. with, the, even, with your complaint. Even with our police, which <laughs> is even more under-facilitated and more frustrated here in Uganda, actually that frust the frustration will be meted out onto the population. Uh, I have in, without intervention from the army, I was read, following the press and was saying that at some point President Ruto directed the army to intervene, they said no. There is no foreign aggression. <laughs> These are citizens. That's the police matter. And I've seen the last clip that the, uh, the president was saying that the inspector general of police is the most competent one in the world, most incompetent. Uh, Who was saying that? President Ruto, a clip, a video of him talking and said he's the most incompetent, very indecisive. In other words, he was saying, how could he even have allowed those people to get to that level without shooting uh, and uh, deterring them? I want to use deterring because of the position I hold. So uh, I think at the end of the day, it calls upon us leaders who want to be responsive, listen to those people. Now, uh, finally, like Andrew said, it calls for a very, very delicate balance. On the one hand, you have pressures to meet the demands of the population by uh, you know, paying for, their, for the services they need. On the other hand, I mean, you, have, you also have debts to pay, which you, which you acquired as government. What you used them for, how you used them is a different matter, but you have to pay anyway. Mm -hmm. Yet on the other hand, you have a population that uh, says, no, we do not want to pay that, those kinds of taxes. And there's also a reason, by the way, even from an economic point of view, 
When you overtax a population, that population will never develop because the incentive to invest is down. I mean, they make very, very little savings. They cannot invest. Some cannot educate their children because they are overly taxed. So it is a very, very delicate uh, balance and a very small red line to cross. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, finally, Dr. Patricia, any take-homes for us, especially in this whole process, until where it is now? Thank what you very much. Uh, for me, I think looking at what happened in Kenya, of course it's unfortunate, like uh, people have already, panelists have already hinted to. But for me, I am a believer in uh, uh, peaceful dialogue. I believe those problems would have been identified and the head of state would have got to sit and find solutions. Because if people are demonstrating and showing their dissatisfaction with a bill, what was the process it took for that bill to get to that level? Did they consult with the communities, with the stakeholders, and so on? So I think, for me, I, I am very happy with the, the, the directive, the, president, the direction the president took by conceding because for a strong leader, a strong leader is one who, 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 first of all, acknowledges his mistakes and gets to apologize and goes back to the drawing board and say, where did we go wrong, and seeks to correct his mistakes. And I believe that can be done by dialoguing and encouraging a conversation with the demonstrators. If it can go back to consultations, let the people put down what concerns them and how it can be properly addressed by the state. But this whole violence and killing, killings happening and the destruction of life and property, I wouldn't encourage that. I encourage peaceful uh, dialogue and uh, uh, round table discussions and coming up with workable solutions which basically would help to address uh, the outstanding problems and challenges. Just like it happened here, when the taxpayers, the, the business people were demonstrating and had locked up their shops, the head of state got to bring them together and he met them, he had tried to address the issues and went issue by issue. He gave it time, and I think it's, he's still in the process of addressing some of those issues. So it's not instant. It is progressively with time, through consultations and so on. And I think that is the strength of a leader. Yes. But Thank just by the way, I, I lost the point because when I was listening to Patricia, I saw the point I initially wanted to make. You see the weakness of the Kenyan state. When they started proposing this, I saw President Russo said there was a consultative process. If there was a consultative process, what did that process produce? I am sure maybe that process produced the idea that we should go ahead with the bill. Maybe the consultations did that. If they did not, did the MPs and the government disregard the, the views in the consultation process? But the second thing is, normally a state should have intelligence. Uh, it should be able to gather intelligence and establish when people are saying, these people are promising we're going to demonstrate, they're going to demonstrate. The incompetence comes that the president should have been briefed, look, from our intelligence, everywhere people have mobilized, these are the likely outcomes, and these are the preventive uh, or deterrence measures we need to put in place to ensure it doesn't happen like this. So to be caught unaware as like this, and have all this violence and then you retract, it really shows a serious weakness on the part of Ruta's president. No, they were sleeping <laughs> on the job. Let me just say one thing. Yes. I, I, do, I think Andrew is, is being unfair, although maybe memory loss, you know, with the age, <laughs> <laughs> Some of these things catch up. <laughs> but you, you, you see, even as recent as 2017, I, I was not told, I was in Kenya myself, the election of 2017 was almost lost on the account of the price of, of Ugari. Just the price of Ugari. The whole country went on a frenzy. And for Kenya, it's just not normal yeah, about... So why did it, <laughs> <laughs> so it was not just only in Nairobi. <laughs> Andrew, listen. Riots began in all cities, and cities are many. Mm -hmm. It was in Aivasha, in Kisumu, in, 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 in Elba, North Eastern. And people said, Check, this election is going to be lost on the account of the price of Ugari. Of Ugari. Mm -hmm. And they had to adjust. So the issues in Kenya are spontaneous. So I, I, I think that you are overbeating Ruto. Ruto has also in the past led riots, you see. He, has, he himself has been a leader of, of riots, I, I have to say this. So I think he knows that you, you, you have to be flexible sometimes. Maybe you, you, you disengage. Yeah. yeah. So what are you talking about? We've been there because for them, you, you, listen, listen. In, in 2007, would, would you imagine any African head of state 
who has been sworn in because of the occurrence of riots in Kisumu, in Naivasha, everywhere to say, look, let's negotiate power. That's what happened. Okay. But people, many people had died. So um, we are, let's look at you Kenya. He's an expert in the protests. Uh, he, has a, he has led protests before. Honorable Lydia and... Uh, and so let's, so let's the, the, the issue is, is the, the, the issue is, mm. for me, I think, yes. we, 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 we would all be right. Maybe <laughs> this yesterday's <laughs> statement is a strategy to disengage, but re-engage. And, and you, you the have to give The one of calling it. them criminals? Yeah. Or the one of today calling, listening? You advance. Mm. Advance. In politics, nothing is permanent. Today you can be a criminal or an ally. Yeah. Then tomorrow you're an ally. Yeah. What don't you know about Kenya? Every election year, they have a new vehicle. The ones they were fighting with, they become colleagues. That's how that set is run. Okay. But, but, uh, and, and let me and tell you, and, and, uh, let me tell you, it's not about Philip okay. Philip Philip. Andrew that and Honorable Lydia. Lydia. Let, let's, but, let's, but, let's leave but that one at that. But in 2017, let me, let's, let me conclude okay. with this. Let, 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 let ladies, me conclude with this. Let's, let's the criminals yes. now, tomorrow, they are yes. like heroes. Yes. They were able to win an election on account of the price of Ugali negotiating. And let me tell you, because of the IT, this IT and the communication, the, 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 the communication and the mobilization is so fast. So it's a strategy to disengage and then re-engage. I, I think that we should do support Kenya, learn lessons, but also appreciate who they are. Who they are. Yes. yes. Okay. It's very, very important. Maybe just I one agree. message and then... It has been a painful, I think, and interesting phenomenon. Because as, as everybody kept observing, they were not really led by anybody. They were, it, it was like a, a, a mass agreement. It was a social contract that they would not have this bill signed. Um, I congratulate the president on listening to his people. I love the way he has said, I concede, because you've got to give them their victory. Um, I feel bad that it had to come to this. A, a lot of lives have been lost. A lot of property has been damaged. Um, but also a lot of trust has been broken. Uh, the leaders that passed that bill in spite of the protest, they didn't listen. The representatives of the people didn't listen. But the leader, the, their foremost leader has listened. I think as neighbors who have families and friends there, we are relieved. Um, it's time now to heal wounds, heal relationships, and, but also learn, learn from this. Learn that um, there is a social contract that every leader has with the people that they govern, and it's very powerful when you honor it. Thank you very much.